What's going on, Junkie Nation? Gorgeous George and Goes are back. We get to talk to one of the great ones here in our sport, Dan Hardy, who's done it all. He's fought. He's commentated. He's got a podcast. He breaks down fights. And Dan, I want to lead off with this. Are you matchmaking for PFL as well? Did I, how, how did I miss that? Is that true? I am for PFL Europe. Yeah. So j just the uh, just the European region right now. I'm commentating on Bellator and on PFL Global. But um, yeah, PFL Europe's my, my baby. I'm the one that's signing and matching the fighters. How do you like it so far compared to other gigs you've had? I, I like it. It's a different kind of challenge, you know, staying on top of all these fighters and making sure paperwork goes through and all these kind of things. There's, there are a lot of things in the background for MMA shows that you don't necessarily think about until you're on that side. Um, but but I'm, I'm enjoying it. I just wish I had more shows and a bigger budget so I could sign more guys because, honestly, like the, the thing I've realized taking on this job in Europe is that we just don't have enough shows for the amount of fighters out there. There are so many fighters in Europe that are trying to be active at the moment. So uh, I'm hoping that I can get a few more shows soon. And are they quality fighters? Uh, like, you know, I mean, is it just bodies or you really see quality fighters that could one day be world champs? No, we, we've got a lot of good quality fighters. I mean, just this this event coming up uh, June 8th in Newcastle. Um, we've got Savannah Marshall making her MMA debut, which is exciting. And, you know, anytime a high level boxing world champion crosses over, I, I always want to see how well they adapt. But then, you know, you just go down the card, you know, you've got the likes of Mark Ewan, 5 0, very, very dangerous. He's taking on Claudio Pesea, who's trained by John Kavanagh. Both of these guys have got potential to be absolute superstars in the future. But it just so happens that, you know, six, uh, their sixth fight in their pro career, they're matched against one another. You know, and it's the same up and down the card. Ben Willis, another one, what three and 0 4 and oh now in MMA, super sharp striking. You know, two time world champion kickboxer. Um, lots of exciting prospects that are like right at the beginning of their career. Um, and you know, the pathway obviously is you, you get that European title, and then you move on to the, the global roster, and you try and get the million dollars and the world title. So there's, you know, there's a good pathway now for these young uh, European prospects. And I'm just trying to make sure that the matchups are right and fair and everyone's got a good chance at, uh, at, you know, making their dreams come true. Would you say this is like Strike Force Challengers back in the day, Pride Bushido, uh, Dana White Contender Series? Is that what, what you guys are trying to create? Yeah, I mean, so like the idea is that, that PFL are going to open up uh, leagues around the world. So we've got PFL Europe as our first one. P uh, PFL Mina just had their first event. So the Middle East and North Africa is taken care of. Now we're going to look at other regions of the world and open up leagues there. So we've, we're basically effect uh, effectively creating feeder shows for the PFL global roster. So, you know, I think in years to come, we'll have... 10 fighters on that, you know, in each weight class, all with belts from different regions, be it Europe or the Middle East or whatever. And and they'll all go into the, the global championship and, and then try and get the world title. Like that, that's ultimately the goal. Um, we're, we're moving in that direction now. We've got two regions opened and we've got several more that are coming in the, in the next couple of years. What will it take for you to get more shows and a bigger budget? Um, like, have you already spoken to the brass and do you need to meet certain goals for you to attain that? I, the, the plan's already there. It, it's already built in to keep growing, um, you know, holding more shows next year and the year after going into areas of Europe that we've not done before. You know, we've been to Paris a couple of times now and we did uh, last year with Cedric Dumbay against Jordan Zebo was a, a sellout, you know, nearly 6,000 seats. Then we moved to a different arena, a bigger arena to the Accor. We sold that out in March as well. Um, next time around we go to, to France, we're going to go to Lyon. And they've never had a show the size of a PFL Europe event before. There'll be 15,000 people there. I don't know exactly who's on the card. I don't want to um, start any rumors, but it, it's going to be a, a spectacular card. And that will have four European champions on it, as well as the, the standout French fighters that will be in showcase bouts. And, you know, as long as we keep doing that, we keep having shows that people enjoy and hosting fighters that people are excited to watch. We'll keep growing. You know, MMA's only going to get bigger from this point out. And I think, uh, you know, a consistent, systemized approach to the sport, like a league format, I think, I think we're going to really, really need it in the years to come. Dan, you know, you mentioned Cedric's name, and 
something that George and I have always talked about um, is we go back way back. One thing that we used to always like, and I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember when they brought BJ Penn out to the Octagon and him and, and Matt Hughes kind of had a little face off? Um, I like that Pettis got in there. I like that him and Cedric kind of set something up. And, and some people will say, eh, it's too WWE or it's too this. Um, as a fighter, how do you like those situations? And then also, you know, being part of a promotion, do you think that's beneficial? Is it too over? The, like, what's your thought on it? Because we kind of ate it up. Yeah, I certainly think it can be beneficial. The one thing I don't like is when it's clearly not organic. You know, and and the thing with, with Cedric Dumbe is as soon as you put an opponent in front of him and you're like, this is the guy you're fighting next, Dumbe's desperate to fight them. So it, it, it's, he, he always makes it very honest and organic when, when he's facing off. Like, even if you go back to the weigh-ins the day before the event, um, and he was on stage with with Jalil. Uh, he he didn't really want to acknowledge the fact that that uh, that Pettis was there because he was so focused on his opponent. I think it's I think it's really good for promotion if it's the right matchup and if it's the right fighters involved. I think if you do it too much, it can become quite oversaturated. But w with someone like Cedric Dumbe, and of course, you know, if you're matching him up against Anthony Pettis, one of the most well known fighters in all of mixed martial arts, to have that moment where Doombay's just want to fight in spectacular fashion. They're faced off. There's a few words exchanged. It, it just gets people excited. And and I think, uh, you know, I think this was the right right fight to have the face off in, in the cage. You know, it, it's so tough right now because um, there's so much MMA and not just MMA, but just combat sports to consume that it's it's unfortunate sometimes for fighters because as soon as the card's done, they just throw another 14 or you know, another. 24 fighters at you and you kind of have to remember who's this guy again and what's going on and so that type of thing kind of helps you remember like oh yeah okay i want to i'm fired up to see that so and i do agree with your points um i wanted to ask you this before the interview we kind of talked about this and i want to ask you a couple advice questions about pfl and so if i were a fighter for pfl europe and i asked you how do i stand out over everyone how do i take that next step what would you advise the fighter you know engaging your, your fan base your audience is always useful uh, the the best example i have is a, a kid called patrick haberora um so he was an amateur champion coming out of belgium a very exciting fighter um he made his pro debut and then literally the day after he started this campaign on social media he was tagging me in everything he posted talking about fighting on pfl paris he wanted to be on that show and the amount of noise that he created online, I, I, like, I literally couldn't ignore it. You know, I, I got in contact with his coach and we got him on the card and, and he had a, a fantastic performance and uh, gained, I mean, his social media following grew tremendously from that event. Um, that's always a good way of going about it. You know, engaging your, your fan base, the people that are going to come and watch you fight. You know, even if it's just a, a hardcore few people, they can sometimes make so much noise that they'll put your name in front of people that will then join the fan, you know, the fan train and, and follow you to the, the world championships. Um, curating a fan base, I think, is one of the best ways to do it because, you know, that that speaks in a lot of ways to me. You know, first of all, it means that you're, you're personable. The fans want to follow you. You're exciting. You give them a reason to watch and you give them hope that you're going to go somewhere. You know, these are all things that, for a, a young prospect that I'm looking to sign for PFL Europe, these are the qualities that, uh, you know, are very, very important. And a, a strong fan base and a good following is a, an, an easy um, indicator of that. If I'm a fighter about to embark in a season format, what is one piece of advice, one thing that you've noticed throughout the years of covering this that would help me adjust to that format? I would say to pace yourself. Um, often the the challenge for fighters coming over from other organizations and coming into the PFL format is that they, they don't realize how taxing it is to step out of the smart cage and know exactly when you're fighting again. And, you know, you, you're in this cycle as soon as the first regular season fight has happened. So that, that's something that takes some time adjusting to. And, and you, what you see with guys like Olivier Aubon Mercier that have been through the cycle once before, they can put that knowledge and that experience to good use. And they sometimes they'll they'll pull back a little bit on their tra on their training. Like w when I was fighting back in the day, because I was competing so often, I think my, my first year, I think 
I think I had 14 fights across MMA and Muay Thai. Like it really kind of it, it does away with the need of so much hard sparring if you're active all the time. You know, if you're taking fights regularly, if you're having four fights in eight months, you like you don't need to be doing as much hard sparring as you would normally do in one individual training camp. So the the um the willingness to kind of pump the brakes a little bit and make sure that you arrive at the next fight a hundred percent. That would be my main piece of advice for anyone stepping into the regular season. Dan, how, if I'm a successful fighter in the PFL, how do I not become complacent? Man, you know, I think it's difficult to become complacent, especially now we've taken on the Bellator roster as well. You know, we, we've had a lot of Bellator fighters join the regular season. It, we're, we're almost at a 50-50 split, and that brings a level of uh, a level of competition that, uh, that I think the PFL had, didn't have previously. You know, you look at the Champions v. Champions event, it was a very, very strong showing for Bellator, and I think anybody on the PFL roster now, knowing that they're mixing with the highest-ranked Bellator fighters, they... It is, this this season is just a different level entirely. And I think that next year it's going to be the same again. It will increase because the, the level will always be pushed by previous year's champions. You know, we, we've had Brendan Lochnane, Bubba Jenkins, Chris Wade, all, you know, champions and, and uh, championship contenders blown out of the water last year by uh, uh, Pineda and uh, Braga. Like, that that's the beauty of the PFL format. Next year, there's going to be some killers in there that we're not even talking about right now. Um, but most likely, they'll cut their teeth on the regional circuit. They'll come through PFL Europe or MENA, and then they'll step onto that roster ready to to claim a world title. So I think the longer the PFL runs this format, the stronger it's going to be, and the the the, the more difficult it will be to get complacent. You know, and then say if if you win the championship two years in a row, you've got. Uh, Bellator champions to challenge these options to step into different combat sports that, of course, the PFL are open to. So, you know, there there are good options and lots of showcase bouts that can be had if you're a, you know, an MMA superstar like someone like Pettis, for example. Last thing from me, um, being on the matchmaking side now, is there one thing that you can point to that maybe you weren't aware of as a fighter? Fighter, like oh man matchmakers really got to go through like something that you just didn't realize as a fighter that happens in matchmaking i think i think people have different styles of matchmaking i think people also have different concepts of what it is to be a matchmaker like what what i'm not trying to do is is determine who's going to win these fights and that is not a style of matchmaking i appreciate you know you know when, when i can see when i can look at a fight card and tell you which side of the card's going to win I'm I'm losing interest, and I, and the fan base is the same. And I've said this to the fighters. I give a little speech after the weigh-ins, the the ceremonial weigh-ins to the fighters, and I always make it clear: look, everybody that's on a PFL Europe card, they're all in a fight that they can win. Every single person is matched up with an opponent that they can beat. It just requires them to show up and give their best on the day. And someone's best is not going to be quite good enough to beat the other person on the other side of the cage, but. That doesn't mean that the, that the fight is not winnable for them. That goes for every single person on one of my cards. Um, I, I always had a massive appreciation for Ian Dean, you know, the longtime matchmaker at Cage Warriors. He's been around for, for so long. He knows the sport, particularly in Europe, so well. And his matchmaking was was an art form. I always would would look at the matchups and go, that's, that's very, very clever. Because if he has a good day, he's going to win this way. And if the other guy has a good day and he's uh, he's on point, he's going to win because of these skills. And that's for me as a fan watching these fights, what I want to see. I want to see the possibility of both of these these fighters being able to, to have success. Um, so that that for me is, is the biggest challenge, I think, is to try and balance the matchups and make them fair all around. But certainly an important uh, signature of my my events. What country submits the most fighters to you that kind of caught you off guard that you can say, hey, watch out for the so-and-sos, they're coming? Man, the Belgian fighters are on the rise. <laughs> the, 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 the Belgian fighters are on the rise. And I think, you know, because MMA has been legalized in France now, I think the Belgian fighters are getting more opportunities to fight on bigger shows and, and really show what they're capable of. Um, the kid Patrick Haberora, keep an eye on him. He's fighting on Ares at the moment. He's going to be coming back to PFL very soon. Um, he, he's got a load of teammates that are very, very dangerous. And another another country as well that to keep an eye on. And, and you know, 
we, we've seen a few Georgians come through, but the, the, the Georgians across Europe right now are causing real havoc. Um, they've got strong wrestling skills. And uh, I'm 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 on the search for some from some good Georgian fighters to add into my bracket. I've got a couple right now, but uh, th there's something going on in in Georgia as well as Belgium. They're the they're the countries that you might overlook in Europe. Um, they're, they're the ones to be keeping an eye on for the future. Great stuff from Dan Hardy, who's also going to be calling the fights, uh, calling the fights that he made because he's got a matchmaker role at PFL Europe. They have a show coming up on June 8th. If you're in South America like me, you can watch them on the zone. But for more information, if you go to the PFL website, it'll tell you exactly how you can view the fights. Uh, go to pfl.com slash Europe or just pfl.com and follow the links. Dan, it's always a pleasure having you on the show. Congrats on the, the new gig that has sprouted up to go along with the other one that you do excellent. And thank you, as always, for your time on MMA Junkie Radio. Thank you, guys. Always a pleasure talking to you.